Good morning. This is Education Sector Television International, ESTV. And the program is One Citizen of Greater Values. This morning, I am with an important personality, a visionary leader, a strategist, highly responsible and responsive. I am referring to the eight substantive uh, Vice Chancellor of Lagos State University of Job, Professor Onani Wadifagun. Good morning, Paul. Good morning, man. How are you? Very well. It's good I, to have you here. Thank my you. My honor, for... too, to have you, sir. <laughs> I do appreciate this sincerely. My honor. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. I thank you for your kind words. <laughs> you are talking about me now. Thank you very much. You deserve the kind words. We don't just make use of words of people that yes. don't deserve it. It will be criminal. But if you, you deserve it, we should use it. You deserve it, Paul. And I must say congratulations. Thank you. I, I saw in the fleet of awards you have where we start that. And I was saying to myself, actually, have you all gotten all this? I I see them. We are in hand there. Congratulations once again, sir. Thank you very much. Thank so you. let's start this with Paul. You were the immediate past vice chancellor of LASU. And from research, I can see that you started as an assistant lecturer going through the rank and files before your appointment as the VC of the institution. This simply means you've seen the good, the bad, and the ugly of LASU. Let's share your experience, Paul. Well, th thank you very much. My name, as you, uh, as you earlier noted, is Olari Wadu Adi Bufabu. Yes, sir. I'm a native of Akiso in the Adimosho local government of Lagos State. Oh, yeah, in Lagos State. Yes. In yes. Lagosia. I'm in Lagosia. My father, my father, the late Alakeso of Akiso, I was the Oba of Akiso land before his demise. And my mother also worked for quite a long time with the local government before her demise. So you are my a father, prince? Yes. My father was a teacher before he became Oba. Okay. So, so at the end of the day, you can say that I'm a very, very much part of the education sector from the time I was born. From my father, a teacher. My mother a teacher before she moved to the local government. Okay. So that has been the and then my 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 siblings also. Uh, the in terms of the career progression for me, I started with the Lagos State University in January 1999. And then of course I rose through the ranks. I moved in from assistant lecturer, lecturer two, lecturer one, senior lecturer and then associate professor. When I when I became associate professor, I left Chimela, I left the Lagos State University for the Nigerian Institute of Advanced Legal Studies at the University of Lagos Campus. And there of course I was appointed a professor there. I was also appointed a professor by the Lagos State University. I was I was at Lasso for some 20 years before I left. And then at the Nigerian Institute of Advanced Legal Studies, I was there for about six years before I saw the advert for the Vice Chancellorship of the Lagos State University. So I applied. And then the rest is history. I became the VC in January 2016. And then I finished my term in January 20, 2021. Okay. So I'd like to see, you were part of the system. You were there for 20 years and above. If yes. I am right. Yes. So you, you really need to tell me the good, the bad, and ugly of Lasso. Because Lasso has a tradition, the culture that we know. And being part of the system, I really want to know the good, the bad, and the ugly of Lasso. Let me say this. I will not say that there is a bad and there is an ugly of Lasso. I will say that Lasso is an amazing institution. Amazing in the sense that, both in terms of the products of that institution, there are quite a number of them scattered all over the world, and they are doing very well. When you look at the governance of Lagos State, when you look at the governance of many states, and when you, when you look at governance at the federal level, you will find products of this institution scattered all over, doing very well. I would also say that in terms of the members of staff, they were just amazing. A lot of kudos to the founding fathers of that institution. And also the proprietor of the institution, the Lagos State Government, they have been very supportive of the institution. But somewhere along the line, 
in terms of management of their activities, there were serious challenges. And that was the period where it was like day to day, year in, year out, it is one problem after the other. It was one problem after the other. There were challenges, there were crises. You see it in other institutions also. But I will probably say that perhaps because they were not able to manage their issues on time, it became pervasive. And it was there for a long time. But in 2016, when I became the vice chancellor, part of what we did was I shared my vision with them. And I told them that let us do that self-introspection. Let us ask ourselves, is this what we want in terms of crisis day in, day out? How will the society continue to perceive us? How will those outside the country continue to perceive us? How do we want to be perceived in the committee of universities globally that it's a university laden with crisis? Certainly no. There is a need for us to be able to manage our affairs better. Because we find a situation then where members of the alumni doing wonderful things that they were doing at a point they were conscious of the fact that the university's name was giving them some challenges because of the incessant crisis and we also invited them to be part of the conversation in 2016 when i got there that it is something all of us must work on together we must change the narrative of this institution the founding fathers, they had great ideas about setting up this place. We started off very well. Then somewhere along the line, this disagreement started on and off. We must come back to the table and agree to correct whatever it is. And it so happened that many people saw that vision. Many people saw the greatness of the university over the years. Many people saw the potentials for further greatness. And at that point, everybody, quite a number of people, I'll say the majority, agreed to key to that agenda that let us set for ourselves a totally different narrative. And that's why, for the period of the five years, 2016 to 2021, we didn't have crisis at us. We did not. Because everybody agreed to work together. Yes. It was not an easy thing. Okay, let me take it from that. Yes. yes. Everybody agreed. Yes. It has to do with the planning, the process, and the implementation. Correct. How were you able to get them to key to your dreams? Okay. You see, that question you have asked is fundamental and critical. The first thing I did was I had a vision which I presented when I attended my interview. And I came first at that interview. There were 14 of us, I came first. The first thing I did was have a clear vision. And that clear vision, I had what I call five pillars for myself of what is it that we want to achieve. And if you look at the, my stewardship, the book I handed over to you some few minutes after you came in, that my stewardship. It captured what we had for the five, the, the five pillars of, the, of, of my vision. Can you recap the five pillars? Well, the first one there is we wanted to achieve peace. Because if you don't have peace, there is no way that you can achieve success. Because you wouldn't even have the respite to be able to do anything. You won't be able to do any reform if there's no peace. As at the time I came in, for almost seven months, the university was at war. As at the time I came in, there were serious issues for seven months before I came in. And the governing council that interviewed me, that brought me in, they were doing so much. That governing council led by Professor Nino uh, Lumu, they were doing so much to prepare the ground so that the new vice chancellor can come in which was the time I was appointed. They wanted the place to be, to, to have that peace for me to come in and be able to settle down to work. And they were that when I came in. So I joined hands 
with them. And what we wanted to do, I had the first thing on my agenda, peace. The second one, to consolidate on the gains of the university. Because as I stated earlier, the university was doing very well when it started off. Before the crisis became incessant, and at a point, it was like they were not going to be able to get out of it. Then the third one is how to bring in funding for the university. Because if you don't have funds, it will be difficult for you to achieve anything if you don't have funds. With funds, you will be able to equip the university. You will be able to do things that will enable the university to stand up and say, I am indeed a citadel of learning at that level. So the fourth thing we had on our agenda was internationalization. We wanted to be a university that would be known globally. And by the fourth year, we achieved it. Because by Times Higher Education Ranking, we were number two after the University of Ibadan. Yes. By Times Higher Education Ranking. On records. On record. And we were also within the band of 501 to 600 universities globally, out of about 1,529 institutions that were assessed globally. We were within the band. And then, the final one was we wanted to be that bastion that will serve the purpose of the Lagos State government. Because when the founding fathers set up the university, they wanted Lasso to be able to produce those manpower that will be able to man Lagos State and then also go out, work within the country, work outside, outside Nigeria. That particular goal of being the basket that will produce it, that was our fifth pillar. We wanted to be able to achieve that. So those were the five things. And what I did was, I started meetings with different cadres. I met with different unions. I met with students. And when, you, when, when I was meeting with the students at the unions, I met with the junior staff. I met with the senior staff. I met with the academic staff. I met with the students. We had interactions with the House of Assembly. We had interactions with the Special Advisor on Education to share with them the vision that we want to run through for the five years. And everybody saw that vision. Everybody saw that we knew where we were going. One thing, you see, when people say Nigerians are not patriotic, I tell them that I differ. Nigerians are patriotic when they see the right leadership, when they see sincerity of leadership, when they see a leadership that has a clear view of what is going, where the person is going, Nigerians will follow. And if I digress a bit, I will say this. If you look at the government of Nigeria today, you will see that there is a clear vision in terms of agenda. But because of the problems that they inherited, it will take some bit of time for them to get out of the woods. But the moment they get out of the woods, if they don't change the pathway that we are going, they are taking the hard decisions. The hard decisions are putting pressure on people because of the baggage that we had on the ground that they are carrying. By the time we are able to move forward and people start seeing the dividends of the hard decisions that are being taken today, hard decisions were taken in times past that people wasted. But this one, if we these the hard decisions that they are taking, if they keep to them and we continue along that path, believe me sincerely, Nigeria will get out of the woods. And at the end of the day, one of the things you will see is that we will now have a structure that will be enduring. But that is by way of digression. Yes. If I come back to the last two episodes, the last two, uh, 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 my term, my tenure. Yes, sir. Maybe at this point, you should iterate on your key achievements. Yes. Okay. You see, after we put that vision in, pla in place, and everybody shared that vision, and we started working along that vision, at that time, it became, a, it became an aberration for anybody to do anything otherwise. And what were the achievements that came after this? 
In terms of sports, Lasso was Lasso became so competitive. The students had this daring thing of nothing can stop them in their path. When they go to the when they go to the football field, when they go for uh, badminton, when they go for all the different kinds of sports, they see it as healthy rivalry when they are competing. Even in the intellectual domain of debating, uh, uh, going for inter inter university activities, they became very competitive. And the attitude they had is, we are ready to kill ourselves there in order to achieve the laurels. Because at that time, we were doing it in the name of the university. We had an ante. And that ante, the way we composed of it was, we asked everybody to make submissions. People made submissions. We had a panel, independent panel, that listened to all the submissions, selected the best three. We now set up a musical stage. For those who prepare the different composition, come and play to the university. The university will vote for the best. In the university, the day we chose, all the different groups played the anthem in their own different ways. Very interesting. Then we now picked one. That one that we picked. When they are singing it, you will think they are going to war. They will be so charged. You see it in them. And that was the intention behind it. Militants. They, will become, they became very militant. That was it. Militants in a very positive way. Mm. That was the intention behind it. We want something that will continuously charge them. So they were part of the system. Oh, you they, were, oh they were part of it. Okay. They were part of it. And then we also ensure that all over the campus, the three campuses, Ojo, Epe, Ikeja, we had signboards with different statements, my own quotes. My own quotes, quotes of other leaders that I loved, we will put it there. You will see there. So as you are coming in, you will see there. You see things like, if you don't have any serious thing to discuss, do not come into my office to waste my time. Mm. At the entrance, mm. you will see such things. Mm. You will see things like, have you reminded yourself today of what you have ahead of you? Mm. You will see things like, time is not waiting for anybody. Utilize your time effectively. Things like the people see things. Things that will always remind you anywhere you turn to on campus, mm. you see there. And then mm. we had quality assurance teams mm. that nobody knew. Mm. I I did it in such a way that I also knew only the chairman. Wow. I told the chairman, we have picked you because you are a man of integrity, Professor Kone. Mm. We have chosen you because you are a man of integrity. You go ahead and pick your members. I don't want to know your members. Mm. So that when they are monitoring me, I don't know. When they are monitoring other people. So at a point, everybody realized that doing things right, is a, it has to be a culture. Because by the time the month is over, there will be a report from the quality assurance team. And they will finger all those who violated. Mm. They will finger all those who are in breach. Mm. So that was part of what we are doing to quality assure ourselves, evaluate our activities on a daily basis, and be able to improve on what we are doing. Then we are also allowing students to give comments, anonymous comments, about lecturers, about other members of staff. So if somebody has not treated you right, you will send a text. There's a, uh, we call it Mr. You send a text to the line of the VC. Don't call that line, just send a text. Mm. I will be in your class, or I will be at that place, or a representative of mine will go to that place where something has been alleged. And they will raise it that the VC is aware of this. What happened? The VC is aware that somebody came in today for this and they were not treated right. Mm -hmm. Then we had this town hall for students. Mm -hmm. And at that town hall meeting, what we would do is every member of management, every dean, every head of department, they will sit in front of the students. And the students, we call it a day of, uh, uh, it's such that nobody will hold you for whatever you say. How often do you do that? We do that every, every quarter. We do that every quarter. Mm -hmm. At that meeting, the students will come and say, I wanted to register for so 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 course. Mm -hmm. I've been on it in the last one month. Mm -hmm. It has not happened. I went to the HOD, they could not solve it. I went to the course advisor, they could not solve it. I am hopeless about it. I don't know what to do. Mm -hmm. I will turn to Jim. Mr. Dean, is your answer, is your question. Mm -hmm. Mr. HOG, is your question. Mm -hmm. That way, everybody became responsive to issues. Because you know 
In another two, three months, there will be that sitting. That issue will come up in the public. How do you respond to it? So everybody became responsive because you don't want to be caught. It's a napping. Oh, yes, you don't want to be caught napping. Mm. And then again, there's something I do. I will just decide to go to a department or a faculty like that unannounced. If I meet the head of if I meet the head of department, or I meet the dean of the place, or I meet the director of that place, we'll make sure that whatever it is that we can use to assist them to do it. But because everybody knew that the vice chancellor or he or members of his team can come at any time, people were acting right. Then I also had a team of professors who will, if we have any project, they will be the one to visit and be sure that that thing has been done correctly. So it was not a case of the VC saying this is the contractor that will do this. No. You will quality assure those who want to work with you. You will select them. You will work with them to deliver. And it is when they have delivered that you write to us and say, VC, management, this is what has happened. Send an inspection team. We will check. It is only when that has been done. And all of these teams, you will see the director of works, the audit unit, bursary unit, registry unit, they are always part of these teams. So it's an inclusive thing. Everybody was involved. Unions were involved, including the student union, in all of these activities. You were able to drive everybody. Oh, yes. Oh, and it was such that if the vice chancellor is not around, nobody knows. Because the deputy vice chancellors knew what to do. I remember on one occasion, Professor Oke, my deputy vice chancellor administration, he called me. I was in Abuja. He called me. He said, Ah, this is sir. We need to take a decision on X, Y, Z. I said, yes. He said, so we want to ask you, what do we do? I said, you're asking me. What if you are not able to get across to me? And time is of the essence. Will you not take a decision? I said, prof, go off my phone. I am busy. I'm doing some other thing there. Go off my phone. I said, go off my phone, sir. Please, go off my phone. He said, okay, you see. I said, later on, I said, look, the way we take the decision when I'm on ground is the way we should take it. Because I can summon emergency meeting three times a day to take decisions. The moment I know that this thing is complex or this thing is intricate, I will not take the decision alone. I will call a team and we sit together. We think through it. If we think we need a larger management team involving the deans and provosts, we bring them into it. They sit with us, we take a final decision and we move on. Your management strategy was fully in place. It was, in, it, and it was very inclusive. When we go to Senate, we don't go to Senate with permutations. We allow issues to be discussed such that it is the best decision. And when it is taken that way, everybody becomes the owner of that decision. Mm -hmm. It is not the decision of the vice chancellor. It's a stakeholder. It's a stakeholder thing. Everybody becomes it becomes the decision of everybody. I do recall that when I got when I when I when I came this year, the I insisted that for admission, it has to be minimum 70% on merits and 30% on discretion. The reason is, I wanted a situation where we will bring in many merit candidates because your input determines your output. If you put in people only on discretion, when their result comes out, you will see that it will not be what you want. And that was why by the time the first set of students that we, when I became this, the first set of students that we had, by the time they were finishing their four-year program, and we saw the result, our first class moved from 25 to 75. Wow. Because the majority of students on campus were those who were ready to, to lead. And again, people said courtesy was like we wiped it out during those five years. When you bring in students on merit, 70% of them, mark my words, you have brought in students who are not ready for courtesy. You have brought in students who are not ready to waste their time. You have brought in 70%. So the remaining 30%, even if they are mischievous people within them, make, make no mistake, part of the 30% will also be very good students. But assuming you have 
a, some, some of them who are not, those of them that are mischievous, the majority will overwhelm them. They will not be able to thrive. So that was one other thing that I reduced drastically those who can call me. Because one of the things we realized, when it is time for exams, is some of those students who are not ready for exams mm -hmm. that will always instigate one crisis or the other so that exams will not hold. But the moment you bring in so many of many students, it becomes a challenge for them because the majority are ready. And that was why back to back for the five years, we were able to do our admission and we're able to graduate students to time without having to stop any of our convocation. So you see that it was a situation where all the stakeholders, members of staff, all the unions, the students, the state government, the alumni, everybody was working together as one. And that was why we were able to achieve the things we achieved. We became a World Bank Certified Center of Excellence. Wow. World Bank Certified I Africa. I love to see that. Yes. We became a World Bank Africa Center of Excellence in STEM education, innovative STEM education. Okay. And this was something pioneered by Professor, distinguished Professor Peter Okebukola. We became, we became the Center of Excellence certified by the World Bank, by NUC, and Association of African Universities. All of them accepted that LASU is capable of generating new knowledge. In that, in that, in that, in that sphere. Mm. So, in number, you need to see the number of benefactors that we had, mm. because our, because we became stable. Mm -hmm. Benefactors were ready to now invest in us. Mm -hmm. Private sector were ready to invest in us. Mm -hmm. We started the, uh, the 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 if, uh, the the fair, that is the students' fair, where we would invite members of the private sector to come and interact with our students. In the course of that, many of them started employing our students. Wow. They were offering training mm. to our students. Mm. Offering training at no cost to the university, mm. to our students. Trainings that developed the skills. Mm. At a point, we had 93 private sector bodies working to do different kinds of training for our students. With lots of yes, private sector. 93 of them working to do different things. There were those who are teaching them how to do uh, handwriting, how to become handwriting experts. There were those who are teaching them to become artisans. There were those who are different kinds of skills collaboration. in collaboration with the university because we had a center of a, 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 an entrepreneurial center led by distinguished professor Anatika. And they were just bringing in all these private sector people to work with us. Because the truth of the matter is, a university cannot work in isolation. If indeed you want the knowledge that is being developed within the university, you want it to become useful to the society, then you must work together with the private sector. It is when the private sector and the universities work together, or the private sector and the tertiary institutions, it is when they work together that they will be able to commingle ideas because it's the private sector that will say, this is a gap that I have in my system, and I'm looking for solution. I want you to think solutions for me. The university will put together their different teams, and it will be, it will be a multidisciplinary team that they will put together. Sociology, College of Medicine, depending on what the problem is. They will work together, and they will come up with a solution, and the private sector will look at it and say, oh, this is very good. Industrial they will take it. Yes, town and ground working it's together. Like, yes. They will take it and then they are ready to pay, sponsor you, because they are benefited from you. Mm -hmm. They are ready. What we are working towards by the time I left is to be able to patent some of the things that our students are producing. And I'm sure the successive administration, they will be able to continue along these roads because they are also opening up a lot of positive and greater things for the institution. Thank you so much, bro. In fact, the majority of what you just said today are not on records. Because I conducted my research, I did not say all of this. That was why I said, okay, let me listen to your achievements. Another congratulations to your research. So let's leave that now and move a little bit to the federal level. Because you know, education starts at the federal, at the state, at the local government. Well, if you are to drive the education sector in Nigeria as a minister for education, 
what will be your areas of priority? Hmm. That's a very deep question. Let me let me start by saying a lot is happening already within the system. Okay. Because I've been privy to activities of the NUC, that is the National Universities Commission, and also TED funds okay. at different times. Okay. I am part of the research body, that is the National Research Fund of TED Fund. Okay. And I've also done quite some work with NUC. And I can say that Nigeria is moving in the right direction. Let me pick some two things to clarify that. When you look at the way TechFund is looking at research in Nigeria today, TechFund is already trying to drive research in such a way that we are not just doing research for the file or for the shelf. We are doing research in such a way that it can impact on the society mm -hmm. when submissions are made to NRF okay. and we are assessing this submission. Mm -hmm. One of the things that we do after your concept note has been accepted and you have prepared your full proposal mm -hmm. and we want to assess your full proposal, mm -hmm. one of the things we do is to ask you in simple language what will be the impact of this research on the Nigerian society. Okay. Because if your research will not Give that impact. We ask you to go back to the drawing board. We guide you on things you need to do okay. for it to be impactful because the government is going to fund that research. So I can say that that is happening and that is critical if we want to be innovative and competitive as a country. Our universities, our tertiary institutions must be able to impact the society if we are going to be competitive as a nation. Okay. That is on the side of tech mm -hmm. On the side of AUC, I am also privy, because I've been a part of it, I'm also privy to the fact that the curriculum of, Nigeri of, of Nigerian universities has been reviewed, and it was reviewed in an inclusive manner, i.e. professional bodies of different programs were called in. The universities had their representatives. Everybody sat together discussing it. What do we need to do? What must we do to change even the approach to teaching? So all of these are coming in. I think the area where we still have some challenges is the funding of institutions. The funding of institutions must get better. This is what ASWA has been fighting for. If you look at countries like Singapore, if you look at the situation of things in China, you will see that there is a heavy vote devoted to funding of education. If you look at China, for instance, they will take their students, they will take them to the UK, they will take them to the US, they will take them to Canada, funded by the Chinese government to understudy different situations, learn new skills, have a clear view of how a number of things can be done in the different fields. And then the expectation is, some of them, if not all of them, will come back and they will be able to replicate this. If you look at India, people say that medical uh, the medical has improved greatly in India. It was intentional. Many of the students were sent out. Some of them came and started teaching new skills within their system. So, getting new skills, teaching people, these are things that government must be willing to invest in. I believe Our, we used to have foreign education scholarships in Nigeria in those days. Yes. So, what happened? You see, I would say that the downturn in the, in the economy, as it affected so many sectors, the education sector was not spared. 
When you look at the budget that the number of states claim that they give to their students, how much is it? By the time you look at the expenses of what the students are going into and what they are being given, you see that it is not much. I am not even talking about just funding the students alone. I'm also talking about the facilities in the universities, the facilities in the colleges of education, the facilities in the polytechnics. There is a need to fund them. Let our university, our laboratories, whether laboratory for sports, whether laboratory for sciences, whether laboratory for English language or any other language, let them be able to answer to that name. When you put the money there, monitor that the money is spent properly on those things. Monitor. Don't just give the implementation. Don't just give the money to the institutions. Have a way of monitoring and evaluation that this equipment, and then you are not going to hold them responsible for maintenance of those facilities. Again, I will say this. We also must be ready. And that is why I said some of the decisions that the present administration is, is, is taking. Some of these decisions, we may not realize the benefit of them now. But as we move forward, gradually we are going to see them. The education loan scheme that has come on board. Okay. You will see that people express concerns about a number of obstacles that students will meet in assessing those, uh, in assessing the loans. Recently, I think there was some directives of Mr. President. Those obstacles have been removed to pave way for students to be able to access those loans. What is the next state that we should be looking at when students are able to access the loans? We should be looking at a situation where when they graduate, employment opportunities must be there, which is why we must meet the challenges of security so that our businesses will thrive, so that there will be spaces for employment by the time these students graduate. Because if the security challenges persist, and businesses are closing up, there will be no way that the students will be able to go out there. This is why we must begin to aggressively encourage Nigerian products, so that Nigerian companies can become bigger, can become more robust, and be able to take in more students. So that, because it is when the students started working, that they are expected to pay back on the loan. So if they finish their university, and they are not able to get employment, it becomes difficult for them to pay back. Yes, sir. Let me quickly ask again. If we are looking at industries and localization, taking their work, uh, do you think there will be that much industries and organization that will be able to accept them to work as, as a white scholar job? Or what is your opinion of you specialization? Say, you say, you say when, you, when you look at the kind of education that students are being given now, Okay. It's a broad-based education. Okay. The fact that you have been trained in the university and law school to be a lawyer does not mean that you must go to court. Does not mean that you must become a company secretary. You can veer into technology when you already have the, the basic, you have gone through that tertiary education. Okay. Look at the number of people in banks. They were not those who read accounting. Sure. They were not those who read banking and finance. Yeah. Some of them read history. Sure. Some of them read Arabic studies. They read different things, but they are excelling because they have that robust knowledge of being able to apply their knowledge. The knowledge they have gained, they are able to apply it in different ways. So what am I saying in essence? It is not mandatory that all of them must go through, uh, must go for white collar jobs. Many of them will end up as entrepreneurs. And that is why the skills they are being given now, if you look at, if you look at what is happening, if you look at the training that is going on in university, you see, one of the things we forget, because we are coming from a situation where so many things have gone back bad, we don't see some of those gains that we are making now. But the truth remains that we are making some gains. The consciousness that people must not be tied to white collar though, has deepened than before. Many people recognize now that you must also be thinking like entrepreneurs by the time you are leaving the university. That is why you see that some universities, aside of having centers for entrepreneurial, uh, entrepreneurial skills, 
They also want to fund their uh, they, some of their students to incorporate companies while they are in the university. They incorporate small, small companies and they start working along those areas. So that it is not new to them by the time they come out. Many of our students, I can tell you, many of the students that we have, you see, we underestimate our students. Oh. In the world, Nigerian students are some of the best. Sure. That is why when you see a Nigerian student go to the US, go to UK, they easily achieve distinction mm -hmm. because they are good. But we underestimate them because we see them, our children, our children. Many of them, as you see them, they are already running small, small businesses. Many of them. As undergraduates. As undergraduates. What do they need? They need some leverage from the system, an enabling environment, a situation where they can enter the bank, which is not available for them now. Because when they go to the bank now, they ask them, bring this, bring that, bring this. He's just coming out, she's just coming out. Where will they get all of those things? So there must be an enabling environment whereby they can get into a bank, get a loan of a reasonable amount, and when they get that loan, the interest must not be killing. Because if the interest rate is killing, there is no way they can survive. When they get that, and they have performed on that, once, twice, thrice, they can increase it and get something bigger. As they are improving on that, they are, they, they are also making their uh, financial, uh, their balance sheet much more robust. And they flourish by the day. Flourish by the day. They are also able to employ more people. Mm -hmm. And the financial institution also is confident that they are performing on their loans. Mm -hmm. I can tell you when we say Nigerians and uh, students are going into Yahoo, students are doing this, students are doing that. All over the world, it's not only Nigerian students. You see students from other institutions doing Yahoo. You see students from higher institutions in the UK, in the US, doing all sorts of things. So it is not limited to Nigeria. So the fact that one or two or three Nigerian students have been caught is not a basis to generalize and say all Nigerian students are this. No, I disagree. Maybe because I have worked with these great young adults. I believe so much in them. The students are... There was a place we were constructed before I left Lasso. It was a place donated by Princess Adejoke Adefurire Oredoke. It's a technology, technology center. We wanted it to be just an incubation center that we will equip and leave it open for our students. People must go there with ideation. We want them to go there and think crazily. That is what our students need. If you go to Yaba, if you go to Yaba, Lagos State Government has done a lot in terms of technology hubs, working in collaboration with private partners. Mm -hmm. You will see the wonders in terms of solutions that these young people are creating. Mm -hmm. All we need, they are not asking us to give them money as if they are beggars. No. Create an enabling environment for them, for them to share their, to, for them to run their ideas. And then create opportunities for them to get some form of funds that is cheap to run these projects of theirs. So many of them will go into uh, 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 agriculture that is technology based. Which will not be more than a plot of land, but will be feeding an entire state. Yes, sir. Yes. How do you solve that problem? You see, that is where the government has a role to play. The government must sit with the financial institutions. I'm a lawyer. I'm a lawyer. I cannot say that I know where the shoe is pinching the financial institution while their interest rates is that high. But there is a need for them to have that conversation in such a way that people are not just looking at making a kill of profits every year. It should be a progressive plan. Because, you see, the problem with capitalism, the problem with capitalist economy, mm -hmm. is that some few will be making so much money, mm -hmm. while the majority will be languishing in poverty. Sure. That happens in capitalist systems. Unless the government is alert to it, 
the government is going to monitor and make sure that there's a balance such that interest rates are not killing. Look, if the interest rate continues the way it is, how many people can do business with it? What kind of business are they going to do with it? It's not going to happen. And then you now find out that it is a lot easier for a foreigner to come in and get a loan in Nigeria for, than for an average businessman in Nigeria or a student just coming out with great ideas to get funds to run this business. It shouldn't be that way. And that is why we have many of them around the street. That is why we have many of them women. And that is why we have some of them also embracing ordinarily what ordinarily they would not want to do because they are desperate. So if we are able, if government is able, that's why I said a lot of things that government is doing now, a lot of things that government is doing now, by the time the dividends are coming out, it's really putting so much hardship on people now. But by the time the dividend is, and you really have to understand that Nigerians are going through a lot. Nigerians are going through a lot. But the government also, they don't have a choice. They must take some very tough decisions. But they must not look at how to aggressively work on these initiatives such that there will be some form of comfort for people. Part of what the government is doing now in terms of how to see, uh, how to manage prices of food in the market. Those are initiatives in the right direction. Such that while you are allowing the maturity of the different initiatives that are going to open up the system, people also, they don't die of this crunching hardship before that materializes. But I can say that a lot of things are happening now that will give us good dividends. Good question, sir. Yes. Good question. Now, let's come closer to our parents, most especially parents with words in the tertiary institution. What do you have to tell them? What I'm going to tell our parents is one, parents must have very close relationship with their, with their children. Very close relationship with their works. Because these young adults, yes, they are, they are, they are adults now because they, are, they have gone beyond the age of 18. But the fact remains that. There's so much they don't know. There's so much they don't know. When it comes to technology, they are very savvy. But when it comes to the wisdom, that the wisdom of the street, let me put it that way, the wisdom of the street, they don't have it. The Many, oh, the street says they don't have it. Many of them don't have it. And that is why it is so easy for miscreants to play on them. But if parents ensure that they have it, and then again, the, the uh, social media is opening them up to so many things that at times it's overwhelming for them. And that is why it is very easy to hear them talk about, I'm having mental issues. I'm having, mental issues does not mean that they are crazy. It simply means that they are challenged and overwhelmed and bodied by so many things at different times. But if parents can show that understanding of I am your friend, I am your father, I am your mother, I am part of you. And the way you can do that is the music they dance to, dance to it with them. The things they do, do it with them. Be open to them to bring their friends home. Be receptive to their ideas. Don't think that you as a parent you know all. You don't know all. Respect them. These are children, these young adults. Sit with them at the table and let them give you ideas. Work together with them. They will have confidence in you. When they have confidence in you, they will be able to disclose things to you. And that way you'll be able to guide them. Mm -hmm. But if you, they, if you have a high-handed attitude of, no, that is the decision, it is final. You're going to lose them. Mm -hmm. And the streets will now be teaching them in ways that you don't like. Their peers will indoctrinate them in ways that you don't know and you not understand. So our children must be very close to us. Thank you, sir. It's very important. Thank you, sir. And you, my last question to the youths. What do you have to tell the girls? I will tell our youths, particularly Nigerian youths, continue to give it your best shot with excellence. We, those of us who know you, we are super proud of you. Nigerian youth. Continue. Don't take up negative vibes. And this idea of 
going out of the country. Well, we will not say some of you should not go out. When you go out, continue to remember that Nigeria is your base. So that whatever it is that you land out there, you come back and give it to Nigeria. For those of you who are staying here, don't be worried. Nigeria is where you have the opportunities. The opportunities are here. Nobody, no foreigner, nobody will come and do Nigeria for Nigerians. Nigerians must be ready to do Nigerians for themselves. It is tough. We will continue to talk about it. We will continue to complain with a view to getting results. But we must not run away from Nigeria. We must love Nigeria. And we must be passionate about Nigeria. And the way you know that Nigerians, Nigerians and Nigerian youth are passionate about Nigeria, look at the, the match that the Super Eagles won. Every Nigerian, that shows you the passion that Nigerians have for Nigeria. Every Nigerian killed up behind the Super Eagles. At that time, we didn't want to know whether it is Igbo or Hausa or Urubu or anything that is playing the match. We just know that these are Nigerians. That is how we should see ourselves. That is how we should see ourselves. So, Nigerian youth, continue to give it your best shot. Yeah, wow, best. what a beautiful morning. Prof, I do appreciate you sincerely. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much. It's my pleasure to have you this morning. Thank you.